You are listening to the WEI Network. The content and opinions of the following show are solely those of their show hosts. The WEI Network, its staff, and its affiliates are not responsible for its content. Any questions or comments should be made directly to those show hosts. Thanks for listening to the WEI Network. Get ready. It's time for the Sports Exchange. Talk, interviews, opinions, and a lot more. Sports from around the globe. It's time for Scott Morganworth and Peter Ween. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Scott Morganworth of Motor City Madmouth in the house with uh, Peter Ween and Samuel K. And, uh, well, guys, we got ourselves a great show today, don't we? You were listening to the W. Yeah, we do. Yeah, it's, it's been a show I've waited a long, long time for. And our featured guest here uh, this afternoon is going to be uh, my childhood idol, Mickey Lola, the MVP of the 1968 World Series. But before we get into a lot of those... Who did they, who did they beat in the World the Series? St. Louis Cardinals. Ah, the Cardinals. And Mr. Lowledge, although I don't ever call him that on the air, he doesn't like it. But yeah. Won three games and hit a home run uh, in game two of that series, and there were three complete games. So, Mickey, uh, why he's not in the Hall of Fame is anybody's guess. But before we go into... Uh, the agenda this afternoon. Are we allowed to ask him his opinion? Of what? Why he's not in the Hall of Fame? Well, that was one of the things I plan to talk to him about. Okay, that's going to be a good question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sure he'll have an answer for that and a whole lot more. But before we go into uh, today's agenda, there has been a change in the schedule for this Thursday. Uh, the Sports Exchange will not, and I repeat, will not be covering the Gator Nationals. Instead, uh, I got a very good opportunity to cover the Sebring 12 hours right up the road in Sebring, Florida. So right. uh, I'm looking forward to doing your Very remote cool. there. Oh, Very yeah. Cool. Uh, my wife's uh, friend uh, over at Chase Bank, Fallon Dard, told me that, uh, Scott, that's a heck of an event that you're going to go to. Yeah. and that, That's big. That's like um, in golf. It would be one of the four majors. Right. And, and there's no question. Right. That, I'm that, glad I could hook you up with that. Yeah, I'm sure you can. <laughs> <laughs> Not. Okay. Uh, I got connections all over the globe, as you call it, uh, with your network. But, yeah, Ken Breslauer and I talked about it. And, uh, you know, he's got, we're working on uh, trying to find guests he'll be on. It's one of those kind of things where you try to find people, uh, you know, in the uh, paddock and uh, the area, the media center. And the goal is to make sure we have a very energetic couple of hours, and that's what I'm going to be. So, so a lot of you folks that were thinking about Gator Nationals, your uh, Gator Nationals has been uh, uh, is no longer on the agenda for Thursday, and the uh, Sebring 12-hour race is going to be an incredible event, and I'm looking forward to bringing you live coverage of that event on Thursday. So, uh, myself and Ken Breslauer will be there. Well, great guest last Tuesday, wasn't he? He yes, a, good overview, yes. a lot of good drivers. Yeah. So, yes. if you're looking for, I'm interested to get your take on um, the course being part cement and part not cement. Right. Well, I'll give you that take when I get up there and see it firsthand. All I know is I had a chance to drive by it a while back with my wife, Candy, and you know, we had a chance to look at it, but until I got serious into this project, uh, I'll, and I'll be spending an awful lot of time there come Thursday. Friday and Saturday. But before I get to Sebring, on my agenda tomorrow, I will be going to downtown Miami where the Detroit Pistons will take on the Miami Heat with the American Airlines Arena. Mm, and that should be a great game. A real good game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, listen, the Pistons are fighting for a playoff spot. So are the Heat. So are the Heat. Yeah, and Dwayne Wade, this is final year, so right. I've seen the Pistons and the Heat in a lot of good games out there. Peter so when Wade. Dwayne, Dwayne Wade is done after the game, does he go to his restaurant or does he go down the block to Stephen Curry's wife's restaurant? Don't know. I'll be in the Pistons locker room. Okay. Yeah, I think he'll probably go to his restaurant you or think? home to his yeah, family. I think so. <laughs> I'll be in the Pistons locker room. So whatever it is, it is. So, uh, and, and we'll have a lot of good interviews uh, from that and a lot of the uh, spring training that I'll be uh, covering over the next uh, couple of weeks as well. So, right. Uh, and the 21st, we've got John... Jonathan Mayo from Major League Baseball calling in, talking about uh, he's been covering not the Grapefruit League. He's been out on the West Coast this uh, spring training, but he'll be talking about uh, the opening of baseball. Well, you know, it's funny. I had an opportunity to go ahead and cover the Cactus League last year. And you know what? To be able to hit eight out of ten stadiums is unbelievable inside of 45 minutes. Right. So when you think about eight. Close to each other. 
Yeah, they are. And yeah, meanwhile, <laughs> well, but meanwhile, last uh, that was past Sunday, but the one before we're in Tampa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's four hours away, so I'm thinking, my goodness, you call, cover an awful lot of ground, in Arizona, not in spring training in four hours. Yeah. But when you're driving the Grapefruit League circuit versus uh, the Cactus yeah, League, yeah. the travel situation, the hotel things are a right. huge uh, factor for sure. Right. Without a doubt. Right. So. Jack Stern will be the only guest on the program that won't be talking baseball. He'll get into some NCAA tournament information. Otherwise, the rest of our guests, are there is a baseball theme to it. Rick Curdy is going to talk about robot umpires that he wrote for the South Florida Tribune. And, of course, I had a chance to catch up with Louis Avalon um, after the uh, Mets game last week against right. the Marlins up right. in St. Lucie. And then, of course, Mickey at the top of the hour. So, uh you know, it's we're all over the diamond except for the little periodic uh, thing that we're going to be on a hard court. So. Right. So, what do you what, what do you think, Sam? You looking forward to this? Oh one? yeah, I'm really looking at. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Mickey Lolich. Um, I was not here to watch him play the game, but I've only heard um, how great YouTube. he was. YouTube. Right. YouTube. I've I've seen I've seen some things on YouTube, yeah. but. Um, I never saw anything live, but I know that this guy really has made his mark yeah. on the MLB. Well, you know what? I was uh, I wasn't from Detroit. I was I was a Yankee fan, <laughs> uh, New York fan. But Mickey Lolich was definitely one of the premier pitchers in that era. You know, the sixties oh, and seventies. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. I'm definitely excited to uh, to hear what he has to say. All right, cool. Yeah. Interesting to hear. I guess uh, he's going to be talking about his book. I would assume. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, which talks about what the '68 World Series, or oh, yeah, yeah, more absolutely. Than... Yeah, I mean, and uh, the, so yeah, we're going to get into that. And they had a good book signing uh, over on s- Sunday w- when the Tigers played the Yankees. Yeah. And this guy, they sold 151 books. Yeah, all right, that was pretty good. I'll, I'm going to mention that to him, Mickey and I. Well, in a short time, I and had uh, a... the only reason he sold 151 books is that people listening to the Sports Exchange knew he was going to be there. <laughs> Well, that's it, man. You know, I got news for you. Uh, he, yeah, he's, you know, Mickey's a pretty down-to-earth guy. Uh, I'm sure he is. Yeah, he yeah. is. Very level-headed. And, I, and yesterday I had an opportunity to spend time with my great friend Tom Gage, who is the author of the book, Joy and Tiger Town. Right. We connected up at Indian Rock Speech as well. So yeah. uh, Indian Rock Speech, I haven't been there since 1985 when Hurricane uh, Elena smashed. It's been longer for me. Has it? Yeah, I've never been there. All right. Well, like I said, yeah, same here. Yeah, well, Inter- yeah, but we have pictures. Oh, yeah, only of Tom Cage and I. No, I'm at the beach. No, I don't care. Oh, I was up there on business. On. No, I never. I didn't. I was in and out of there faster than you can snap your fingers. So. Oh, okay. But enough to take care of business and then yeah. uh, continue my track back into Tampa Bay area. Yeah, right. So, so, but yeah, it's good stuff. I'm looking forward to this. I know that uh, a lot of our We've been working very, very hard to go ahead and uh, bring them on the program if everything goes according to plan, which it should. Uh, Mickey will be on our air, and we'll touch on some key uh, subjects as well. But, but you know what? Uh, I am, once again, looking forward to the uh, uh, Sebring uh, race. I think that's going to be a fun time. And I, and I was telling my friend Trevor Thompson, uh, who's a president of Detroit Sports Media, on Sunday with, when the Red Wings took on the Florida Panthers. Yeah. And what a laugher that was. The Panthers won 6-1. to one. And Trevor really never realized that uh, I, w- I was big into motorsports, but I love motorsports. I really do. So uh, I think the uh, situation with Sebring will hopefully by the end of the week present opportunities to get some pretty good drivers as well as capture the scene for what's about to take place. But Trevor never realized that. When you're in Detroit, guys, everybody's talking about the four major sports. But re- very few people realize that motorsports in the metro Detroit area – Go to Michigan International Speedway where they had a couple of NASCAR events. They used to have an open wheel race in July. Right. And, of course, they have the Detroit Grand Prix there as well. So Motor City. But, yeah, there's definitely a lot of motorsports activity, especially during the summertime. So. Okay. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> You'll take my word for it. Glad to know. All right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, uh, so how, how was your weekend? My weekend was um, pretty good. It was um... – it was one of my friend's birthdays on Friday. We went out, had a had a nice dinner, and then on Saturday, spent some time with my family. Um, uh, I'm really looking forward to this weekend because my father's getting married. Wow. So, cool. um, yeah, so we're going uh, to party New York for that. Time. Oh, party time. Oh, yeah. Small wedding, just uh, really the family, but 
really looking forward to it. A bottle per person. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> no, yeah, but it'll be it'll be a it'll be a fun time. So I'm really looking forward to it. That's good. Mm-hmm. Congratulate him for it. Thank you. I will. Congratulations. I will. I will. Yeah. I will. Yeah, and I'll tell you, for me, the month of March is absolutely crazy between auto racing, uh, uh, where my activities there, spring training. I love this time of the year. I yeah. do spring training. Well, it's good. I mean, uh, you know, part of me is envious that that you can get out and hit all the parks. Uh, the other part of me is like, you know what? I, I did stuff like that 20 years <laughs> yeah. ago. I'm over it. But no, I'm, I, I, I like the fact, especially, you know, coming from New York, everything's big. It doesn't matter. It could be a museum, government, uh, mm-hmm. baseball, needless right. to say. Uh, when I first got exposed to minor league parks, it was like, this is great. I, I love it. I love it. You can take it away. I'll get but, the... Uh, well, there are a lot of great minor league parks, without a doubt. So... Uh, but speaking of minor league, can you just talk to me about Tim Tebow real quick? Yeah. What, I, what, like, is Tim Tebow going to go to the league? Uh, Tim yeah. Tebow actually has been assigned to AAA today. Yeah, right. right so I mean, he's only moving his way up. Yeah, he's headed in the right direction. So good questions. Uh, Tim Tebow, I had a chance to see him actually on uh, Friday and uh, taking his cuts. But he's a baseball prospect. That's right. all he is. Right, gotcha. Okay, so and he's very protected by the New York uh, Mets PR people mm-hmm. as well. But well, we've got we, we've got journalists Jack Stern. So. Jack Stern on the line. Oh, welcome to uh, you're the only guy that'll be talking hoops, Jack, on this uh, baseball program. But that's okay. We'll let you go ahead and not burst your bubble, but talk about who is on the NCAA tournament bubble. Jack, take it away. How you guys doing? Thank you for having me, Peter, Scott, and Sam. Uh, I'm surprised I'm the only one coming on talking about college basketball. Has it like go Gonzaga, go Gonzaga. All right. First, before I get into the meat and potatoes of things, how has it decreased in popularity so much? Every time I turn on the TV, any type of sports programming, seems like everyone's talking more about NFL free agency or a bunch of guys in single A playing a spring training game than college basketball. Yeah, but you know what? If you put on any uh, sports network, especially regional sports networks, I've got, what, five, six of them here? Four of them, not counting the Golf Channel. Four of them, college basketball, college basketball, college basketball. It's all over TV. Yeah, okay. And and you know what, Jack? I'm all over the state for spring training. So Yeah, know. but you know you're not into college basketball anyway. So well, you know. not as much except when Mike Jarvis comes on the air. Yeah. Yeah. Well course, I mean we are yeah. in March right now and March is yeah, starts, is basically next, college basketball what, month considering what, it is March right. Madness. It starts what, the nineteenth, Jack? Yeah. yeah, it's it starts on Sunday with selection Sunday where the brackets are made. Right. Okay. Uh-huh. Well that's okay. I get into it to a certain extent, but I'm a big spring training guy. Yeah. Okay. That's the old so time when, journalist when, guy when, for me. Go ahead. When daylight savings time happens every year, it means that it is time for March Madness. And every single time there's a couple of teams from the bottom half of the 25 or even these Florida Gulf Coast or, you know, teams like that to make a run uh, in the NCAA tournament. And I was curious to get you guys' opinion on a couple of teams that you thought could make a run if put in the bracket that are maybe fl- have flown under the radar a little bit. And then I was going to give my teams. Okay, let's hear it. Oh, you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah. You, you might as well. You're the only one talking okay. college basketball. Yeah. I'm, I'm the one talking college basketball. Well, let me pre- let me preface this, Jack, because I don't want to cut uh, you, you know your your time. But whatever it was, five, eight, nine, ten years ago, when Gonzaga was the Cinderella team, I just love the name of the school, and I'm so happy. I don't know if they're still number one or number two. But uh, they always seem to come up a little short of where, you know, you're right. hoping they go. I'm hoping this is their year. Yeah, the only thing I'll say about college basketball, Jack, and I'm leaving the floor to you, I'm just a Big Ten guy. I hope one of my Big Ten schools wins it all. That's as far as I'm going to go. All right, with. take it away, Jack. Go ahead. I'll, I'll start off by saying I think this is a particularly weak year for the Big Ten, aside from Michigan State. Indiana, mm-hmm. one of the teams that's usually better, hasn't really performed well. Michigan, they're playing well, but they've had a couple of tough losses, so I don't think it's going to be a Big Ten team winning it this year. However, I think some under-the-radar teams have a good shot at winning it all. One of those teams is the Virginia Tech Hokies. They've beat both Duke 
and Syracuse upset those two teams. They're currently ranked in the AC, fifth in the ACC, which shows how tough the conference is. But I think they're built really well, and they have good depth um, on their starting team and on their bench, which makes them poised to make a run. Another team I think can do it is Villanova. They're currently getting no love, ranked uh, 25th in the coaches poll and the NP top 25. I think once we get to, we get to March, we're going to see that veteran team take over. The Buffalo Bulls, a mid-major team uh, led by C.J. Massenburg, who's top five in the nation in scoring, uh, the big man down low. I think they're getting no love simply because Buffalo's pretty much like Siberia, let's face it. Right. That's why all the people from there move on down to Florida with you guys. Right. And then um, the last team, I think a Pac-12 team. The Pac-12 this year has been awful. I'm not going to lie. There's no power. There's no team from the conference um, in the coaches or AP poll, which is quite frankly embarrassing considering they're a Power 5 team. But I think they're really good defensively. They're coached by Mike Hopkins, a former Jim Boheim assistant at Syracuse. They're another veteran team. And they have a very different model for winning games, doing it on the defensive end of the floor. Most of the time, when you see teams winning in March and into April, they're teams that score a lot of points, the Dukes, the Kentuckys. I think if Washington is able to win the Pac-12 tournament this week and make it to the NCAA tournament, they're almost guaranteed to make it to the Sweet 16 because of how different they play and because they have the best defensive player, in my opinion, in the, conf- in the entire country in the Matisse Bible. You know, it's funny. You talk about NBA and the strength is the Western Conference. You talk about college and the weakness is the Western teams. All right, so you brought up the Buffalo Bulls. Okay, Jack, so you know what? Here's what I'm going to say about the Siberia Buffalo Bulls, okay? If I need a Cinderella, let it come from the Buffalo Bulls because they're not getting much love in any other sports because the Buffalo Sabres haven't been good. The Buffalo Bills aren't very good, so We'll just go ahead and root for the Buffalo Bulls. Okay, you got a little bit more out of me than I was going to give you on college basketball. Go ahead. Good research. Yeah. And not, and not only when your research is like this, uh, Peter and I are still waiting for your uh, columns to return to the South Florida Tribune because you do such a heck of a job. All right, so FG, so Florida Gulf Coast is in the NCA, or they're vying for it? Uh, I think there are some mid-major teams currently ranked uh, lower on that could make it. I think Villanova is a team that's getting slept on a lot. Usually they're ranked in the top five, but this time around they're 25th in the country. If I had to make a bracket right now, I'd say they'd probably be the 10th uh, or even the even lower, maybe the 11th seed coming out of the East. Uh, but yeah, I think there's every year, listen, there's one of these FCS teams that comes out and beats a Power 5 team, which is pretty much why there's only one or two perfect brackets in the entire country. I mean, it's really become a science in that sense. But that segues perfectly into my next question, which is why is the NCAA tournament such a crapshoot? I mean, when you look at Obama or any of these political figures making the bracket, they're just picking out the number one seeds or, you know, the highest seeds. And somehow it's like a four or five seed, but pretty much never it's a, a number one seed against the number one seed. Obviously, Villanova was the one seed last year and they made it, but. You know, that's pretty rare. So why do you think the tournament is such a crapshoot? And why do you think there's so many upsets every single year? Even two or three, in my opinion, is a lot. Because every given team can win on any given day. I mean, I don't care. It's all the... Here's the thing, Jack. When you don't have a lot of film on a lot of teams because they don't play in conferences, and coaches go ahead and take what little they can get, and then they prepare for you. It's not like you have a scouting report on these guys. You know what I mean? So, therefore, yeah. they, they don't have any fear. Hey, you know what? We weren't expected to be here in the first place. So, you know, we're on house money is really what it comes down to. So, these guys tend to play loose. And when they play loose, the big majors yeah. are the ones that get nervous. But, you know, for the, the viewer, for the spe- being a spectator, um, you always expect, you know, four of the top five or six teams to keep moving on. Uh, but it's great when you get one of those Cinderella's, whether they make it to the, just the Sweet 16 or they make it to the eight or the final four. You root for them. Uh, yeah, 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 you root for them. It's, you know, the old underdog. Thing. Right. Well, not only. Uh, it doesn't happen often. I don't even know. I can't even remember when they made it to the final. Well, every now and then an Ivy League school will pop up. I know this is way before a few. You guys were born, but when Michigan State won it with Magic Johnson, 
the University of Pennsylvania ended up going uh -huh. all the way to the Final Four. Then they got smoked by Michigan State Magic. Okay, Johnson. so they didn't make it to the final. No, but they got to the Final Four. Yeah, well, I said the final. You don't yeah. get the Cinderella team well, but in the final. Right, well, I wouldn't say that to Butler University, which has been there before. Butler has definitely been to the final. Long before. time ago. It's wow. funny. It's funny when you fill out these brackets, depending yeah. on who you're playing and the knowledge of the people yeah. that you're competing against to who has yeah. a better bracket. You're, I mean, for me, who doesn't have the most knowledge in college basketball, you know, yeah, I'm going for, you know, one or two right. underdogs in the first round. If I hit it, great. Looks like I'm ahead of my, of my competition. But, you know, once the whistle blows, regardless if you're a top team or you're not a top team, yeah. th there's a chance for the underdog to win, That's regardless. It. Yeah, that, it's, it's tied at the beginning. If I'm the underdog in any situation, I, I'm only going into the game thinking yeah. I'm going to take this oh, team right. down. I mean, everybody knows that the obvious offsets are going to be 3-14, 4 versus, what, 12? And the big goes Well, but on. was it last year? Like three-quarters of the people – got blown out the first weekend right. because there were so many upsets. Right. Uh, who was one last year that lost to uh... – Well, Wichita State lost to Marshall, which was like a major upset. Right. That's not the one I'm thinking of. Maybe it the is. The biggest one. Maybe it is. Early. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, you got about five minutes, Jack. Uh, what else you want to talk about? Well, Jack, I actually, I actually had a question for you. You, you graduated from the University of Colorado, right? Uh, in, in about a month or so. Yes. Oh, so you're I still am. there. So I graduated. I'm, I'm an alumni from, uh, from the buff, from the Buffalo. So I actually have a question for you. Why can't the Buffaloes make the tournament? Why are they we that I bad? Actually, I actually think they have a good shot at making it this year, Sam. That's a, that's an excellent question. They kind of struggled early on, but you have to keep in mind, this is a really young team. Also, it's hard to recruit in the Pac-12 because you're up against Arizona and UCLA and schools that, you know, tr traditionally recruit very well. But right. this is a down year for those schools. The Bucks al almost made it into the top four in the Pac-12 tournament and got a first-round bye. And I think they have a good shot at winning it all this year, Sam. Uh, they have some of the best players in the conference. Tyler Bay, I think, is going to be a yeah, first-round pick nice. next year. So, I mean, the, the reason that they're cons they've been consistently bad and they've struggled and you know, there's been a lot of uh, upset fans here is because they have to recruit against some of the best schools in the nation. As you know, it's come to light recently. There's been some dirty recruiting task tactics right, yeah. done by Sean mm -hmm. Miller. Yeah, I was just about thinking NBA. about him. You beat me to that one, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I mean, I, I just think it, it comes down to experience and ability to get top-notch talent. With that being said, I think fans should be happy with mediocrity. I mean, I, I, that's not something you hear a whole lot, but right. all things considered, I think that Tad Boyle, who's, by the way, the longest tenured head coach in the state of Colorado, so that shows he's doing something right, mm -hmm. has done an excellent job just juicing the most potential out of his team. Well, so I don't know, you know, I just, I, I, I just think it comes down to inexperience and inability to get top players, to yeah, be honest. The reality is the Pac-12 hasn't been relevant in a long time. Okay, I mean, uh, aside from aside from aside from Arizona and yeah, UCLA too, but yet UCLA yeah. fires their coach. Okay, so nobody could go ahead and do well out there. I've had uh, Chris Roberts, uh, who will probably come on a future show, the longtime UCLA broadcaster, and guys get with six fifty seven hundred winning percentages get fired. So you only have about well, three how hard to is go, it? Jack. How hard is it to succeed for these coaches? when you're coming off of a legendary uh, program like UCLA, if in UCLA, if they're not uh, a top ranked team or, you know, in the finals, it's a fail, failing well, season. Well, it's only a failed season because of two words, John Wooden. Well, well I mean, well, whatever the reason, but I'm saying his, um, you know, the people that followed him. Right. I mean, they've got a high bar to have to reach. <laughs> That's putting it lightly. And with sports today, you don't come near that bar. Next. Yeah, but uh, but the and you have to, another thing to consider in this situation is, is that it's about team brand. You know what I mean? The Oregon Ducks weren't relevant until you know they Marcus Mariota was the quarterback out Eugene, and all of a sudden they become this popular team that kids like to play with on Madden or you know whatever the video game is for college mm -hmm. football. And you know it's it's just. The, the brand of these teams change over time. And, you know, a coach is brought in who establishes a certain culture. And 
that's another thing that contributes to it. So I think it really just comes down to that. And that's why there's so much changing of the guard in the past. Well, with Oregon, all you had to do is say Nike, and then you don't have to say a whole <laughs> lot more. They're dumping a lot of money into there anyways. And that'll be another subject for another day. But anyways, Jack, you and I eventually, when things calm down here with spring training and March Madness, are going to have a little bit of madness of our own. And that's what we still uh, – talk about Jordan and LeBron James. So I'm, uh, right. uh, you know, get ready to duke it out with me uh, uh, in the month of uh, April. And I guarantee you, Jack, we're going to promote this one big time. The young end versus the old end. Okay. Uh, LeBron versus Michael. Okay. So be ready, Jack. I'm ready for you. But meanwhile, Jack, thanks for being the guy here that provides us with some of the March Madness. And uh, if we have any more collegiate basketball uh, people on the program soon, you might just get an opportunity to interact with those people because you're the only one talking about it anyways. That sounds good to me, Scott. Thanks for having me. Hey, again. hey thanks again for being on the program, right, Jack. Jack. We appreciate you take it, it easy. and we'll uh, be in touch soon. Take care. Take care buddy. Buddy. Thanks, Jack. Thanks. Bye. Well, you know, Jack does bring up some interesting points, but yeah, we're out there with the Buffalo Rome. We'll say some about the Buffalo Bulls. And, yeah, remember, their football team wasn't too bad last year either. Uh -huh. So for a school in a decent-sized city between the Buffalo Bulls uh, football program and basketball, they're getting some quality athletes to go there. Yeah. And speaking but, of Buffaloes, you know, go go Buffs. Go Buffs from Colorado, not Buffalo, but <laughs> Colorado. But it's really funny what he said about the brand and the image of the school. Right. That's really, at the end of the day, what these schools <clears throat> care about. It's about their image no matter how you slice it and dice it it's just about how their image is and how wow. they can build their brand that thing called dollars and cents you think that plays into it oh uh, yeah maybe a little bit a, a lot of it yeah maybe a little bit okay we had a professor on the sh uh, one of the shows earlier today from right. penn state and you know, talking about obstacles and you know in, in life and all that and it got to the point about um, sports and she said she totally is aware of the importance of sports to a university as far as a revenue stream oh yeah and a reputation but she gets offended when she finds that there is a good percentage of athletes who really don't care about the education just uh, get me to the combine or get me picked in a draft somewhere so i could become a professional athlete she said, and that's taking a seat away from somebody who wants and needs the education. And how lenient the teachers are. You know, I'll tell you right yeah. now, when I was at school, when I was a junior or a senior, yeah. I'd be in classes with some of the athletes, and they wouldn't be putting in as much you work as – You weren't one of the athletes. No, I, I wish I was one of the athletes, but no, I, was, I wasn't one of the you, athletes. You earned your degree. <laughs> yeah. But it was funny. It was, it was really funny how – you know, these athletes could get away with maybe not putting uh -huh. in the work that every other student was putting in because – you know, they're, they're up here. They're, their level is up here considering that they're the ones who are bringing in the revenue, the ticket right. sales, the advertising, the TV, like everything. I have a friend whose son plays locally for one of the local schools mm -hmm. on scholarship. Uh, the kid wanted to be a nurse. I forget what kind, a specialized nurse. They told him he's got the scholarship as long as that's not his major because that will take him away from the game too much. Mm -hmm. And he played one year and he's dropping, he's quitting the team. He wasn't looking to go professional, and he said his life is more important than just playing. Well, more power to him. All I know is when I was back at the University of South Florida, I, I had basketball players in a class called sports and sociology. You know? <laughs> it was an easy um, – Basket weaving, yeah, well, shuffleboard. Well, it would take some of the other classes. But yeah, the sports yeah, and yeah. So sociology class, they didn't have to think a whole lot there. They kind of fit in with that one. So Was that why you were there also? No, I actually enjoyed it. It was one of the few sports classes I actually But you didn't have outside. to think too much. I'll tell you what. Being a communication guy like I was yeah. back then, I enjoyed it because being in the industry, okay, right, uh, like we are, you know, since we don't play inside the lines, we got to think outside the lines. Right. And I thought that was a pretty interesting class. I only just see a bunch of the basketball players. Yeah, right. right. There's another story, too. So, right. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And the, and the fact that none of these students are getting paid. Right. You know. Supposedly. S supposedly. Yeah, right. You know. Okay. It's, I think it's funny, though, for the ones that aren't, for the ones that are not getting paid illegally, yeah. you know, they're the ones who are essentially bringing in the money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know. <laughs> interesting. Very. That's a whole different Very topic, but I just wanted to bring that up. All right. Now, Rick Curdy is going to be coming on in a, about a minute or two. So let's get, give an overview about what he's going to talk about. He's been talking to me about robot umpires, okay? Uh -huh. And now he's going to have an opportunity to elaborate. They're starting that in the single-A league, I think, Yeah, right? it is. So. Yeah. 
you know, uh, Rick does, he likes to write for the South Florida Tribune. He really does. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I said, anything you want to put up there, go ahead and do it. And he came, comes up with a pretty interesting idea, the robot umpires. Now, that's a question we're not going to about Mickey Lowe's because there's just way too much material to get to in a long period right. of time. Now, does that have anything to do with the the timers that are now, like the shot clock for baseball oh. with the this robot umpire? Is that, um, I don't know. Is, they that, may is, have is there any timer correlation? Or... I don't know. That? Are they using timer in the minor leagues, timing the pitches? Yeah, I believe they are doing pitch clocks there. Yeah. Yeah, but they're going to get a lot of resistance at the major league level doing it. But yeah, yeah. the minor leagues, they can experiment yeah. with anything. So, but that said, Rick Curdy is about to join the South Florida Tribune hotline. Okay. And he will be talking about robot umpires. So, uh, you know, but so just so you know, folks, the South Florida Tribune is a great source of information. If you want to check us out, www.southfloridatribune.com. So, www.southfloridatribune.com. And you can check out all the nice quality content that we have. Some of our local schools that are involved with the South Florida Tribune consists of Lynn University and Florida Atlantic University as well. With that said, okay, Rick Curdy, let's talk about road umpire, uh, robot <laughs> umpires. Okay, do they compute? Uh, Mr. Samuel K. Uh, was very curious about it. Go ahead and take it away there, Rick. Well, the uh, Atlantic League Professional Baseball has been around for 20 years. And they recently partnered up with Major League Baseball. And Major League Baseball is experimenting with some little tweaks here and there with a, like a runner on base, starting an inning, pitching clock, and robot umpires. And, yeah, I meant robot umpires. And the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball, they're using it as a testing ground in that league. So I think it's weird. Um I don't really like it. I don't want to see a robot umpire. I like it when it's called by human beings. I know they make mistakes. I know the strike zone's not as inconsistent sometimes, and the games could drag on, but I just think it's really, really weird. I remember years ago, uh, Major League Baseball came out where they wanted to do away with the intentional walk. Uh, not mm -hmm. do away with it but throwing the four pitches out of the strike zone. Right, right, right. They wanted to just say, okay, I'm walking him. And Casey Stengel, I believe, was uh, so I'm going back to the 60s, was one of the uh, very outspoken, I mean, he was a maniac to begin with, but very outspoken. Right. He says, you're taking chance out of the game. Right. The game is, you know, not every pitch is the same, not every ball rolls the same way. Uh, there could be a pass ball on an intentional walk and runners can score. Right. You, mm -hmm. You're taking an aspect away from the game. Well, and, well I, I, he's right, but they eventually did get rid of it. Yeah, well. But that's, man, that's this day and age. But I agree. Listen, I, I'm like you, Peter, okay? You and I can really say that we, we go back a ways covering this game. And there's so many things that they've taken out of it, unfortunately, yeah. that I wish they had in there. But the reality of the situation is, you know what? This is a different era where they're trying to speed things up. But. So my question, and maybe you know this, Rick, umpires <laughs> in Major League Baseball, uh, uh, they full time umpires, or like, are they like NFL referees that sell insurance and work games? No, they're full time. They got full time jobs. This they're, is a full time job. That's what yeah. the NFL should do too. So, well, definitely the NFL should do that. And I guess major league. My attitude would be, major league baseball should do uh, ongoing education for the umpires and keep it human. Yeah, I mean, I'm all about human, you know, the NFL officiating is atrocious. And Major League Baseball, they make mistakes. The umpires do a great job, you know. I understand they want to speed up the game because, you know, the young they're losing the young people. Yeah. The young people are too busy tweeting and on their cell phones and everything is now, 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 now. That's our society now. And people just, I don't think they have the pace to sit for a three-hour or three-and-a-half or sometimes four-hour right. game of baseball and they're trying to appeal to the younger people and the attendance is, uh, is going down in, in these, in the stadiums when they go. And I, I get why they're doing it. They want to be more consistent. And, you know, I was, I just think it's still kind of weird. And I mean, can you, can the managers argue with the computer if they don't like the call? Well, that's the whole thing. And uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to see, keep the human uh, bring in some sort of um, instant replay. What was it last year, right? Mm -hmm. um, just bringing some instant replay. Uh, it, it's 
pretty much obvious. If uh, there was interference on the fence, if a fan reached out and stopped the outfielder from, you know, leaping and catching the ball, instant replay can reverse a call or make a call. Well, they have instant replay in baseball, and that was one of the – I remember when they brought – we're going to bring that in. And, um, I mean, it's it's fine. I'm fine with that. Yeah, I think they only the do it in playoffs, play. though, don't they? They don't do it during the regular season, do they? Instant recall? I, replay? Well, no. Yeah. Right. They do it in regular season? Oh, yeah. They got replay in regular yeah. season. Yeah. Okay. They now, do. Rick, Rick, for, for the people – for the fans that don't know – exactly what robotic umpiring is can you kind of go through the process or kind of go through what it means when there's a robot umpire like is there a robotic umpire sitting behind the batter on the, the, the back of the plate is just a computer up on um or taking just stats man- or, or just is it, yeah mannequin. right what, like what is a robot umpire well i what i what i've been hearing about it is that it's just a computer it's not really like it's not like going to be it's not going to be like robocop up there you know in, in <laughs> you know <laughs> like you know, attention uh, to walk, you're gone, bye. Right. Yeah. It's not like it's not like that. It's actually like a computer that's going to be like in the uh, in the stand somewhere or like up in the press box somewhere. And and they're going to hook it up and it's actually going to call the balls and strikes. So now what's the ben- it, what's the benefit of it? It's supposed to make it more accurate because sometimes the umpires, you know, sometimes if it's high, low, and sometimes a lot of times the batters will argue, say, hey, that was too inside. This is supposed to be like a scientific, accurate reading of what a ball is, what a strike is. But you know what? How many, how many umpires are there in Major League Baseball? Oh, let's take just American League. How many umpires? Well, actually, they're not broken under American League or National League anymore. They're all yeah. They're, they're okay, both so, one. okay, so how many umpires Five. are there? Well, well, the point I'm getting to that may be misleading is you, you're in Major League Baseball. You play certain teams like, what, 18 times and other teams nine times or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're in these ballparks. You kind of know these umpires, and it's like, oh, we got uh, we got Charles, you know, right, umping right, right. behind the plate. You know, he calls high mm. strikes. Right. You know, he calls low strikes. Yeah. Um, as angry as I get on a missed call, I, I'm still rather, you know, there be a, a way to perfect the ball in play rather than whether it was an inch too low or an inch too high. Well, well, there was a period when they had Quest Tech out there, though, didn't they, Rick, uh, when they tried to go ahead and uh, micromanage the umpires there, but that didn't last very long. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I mean, it, it just, like I said, you're taking the human element out of the game. Right. You know, we all know they're going to mess up, and that's what makes it fun when, you know, you see this, you're like, oh, my God, what a terrible call, you know, but it's just part of the game. It makes it fun. And I just the whole robot, uh, the whole computer or robot or whatever they want to use, right. it's just it's just kind of weird, you know. The pitching clock is fine. You know they what? Have, yeah. They use one in minor league baseball, and you actually don't even pay attention to it and stuff like that. Yeah, so well, okay yeah, the, the pitching clock, the right. pitching clock will work, and I, I okay as long as they counter it with not letting the batter take an extra ten or fifteen seconds to you know fix it and re. Velcro is glove. Yeah, they do. And, they, they've they've done that. Yeah, you can't step out of the box. You can't right. Adjust. Remember, no more Garcia Parra. Oh man. He yeah. Bad thing. He yeah. would have messed up with his gloves and the little tweaks and all that stuff. And yeah, they don't do that anymore. They don't let them like like step out anymore like they used to. Well, or... yeah, they're cracking down on that. But you know what? I'm still not a proponent of the pitch clock. I I don't care. I mean, you know what? If you want to count the mound visits on from six to five or whatever. That's fine. What big deal. I mean, whatever these guys are going to say, whether it's a mom visit, they're going to well, talk about it in the dugout yeah, anyway. Right? But I have to tell you, what I find humorous is they want to cut the length of the game down. So they're putting in a pitch clock. So if that pitch clock is basically going to save six minutes right. to the length of the game. So you're going to have a game that's either three hours and 23 minutes or three hours and 29 minutes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. It doesn't cut it down. It doesn't cut it. It cut it down like 10 minutes. And it's still like, it's still an ongoing problem. And that's why they're using the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball as like a testing ground to try these tweaks and here and there, like having a runner start on a base in the inning, which I don't like. I think that's dumb. And I, um, I'm, like, ju- I'm just yeah, like, don't, don't ever expect to see that one. Yeah, and I'm just league. envisioning here 
I don't know if you ever saw the Big Bang Theory where Leonard and uh, Leonard Sheldon didn't want to leave his room, so he had a laptop robot going around to work and everything. Right. And I'm just envisioning having this um, robot, robot, you know, <laughs> like a stick figure yeah. uh, with yeah. a with a tablet sc- face, you know, standing yeah. standing or crouching. <laughs> Behind yeah. the uh, behind the plate. plate. I mean, do you do, does he eject you? I mean, if I mean, if you do something wrong, is he gonna come and eject you? Is he gonna like shoot and, you with his ray gun? If you... Right, right. <laughs> and and what? Is, how does that affect the hitter? You get up to bat. You know, you got the catcher squatting down just behind you, and there's another person behind him. Now all of a sudden, you're getting up to bat, and there's only a catcher. That changes things. Mm-hmm. The fact that there yeah. isn't another body back there. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I don't even know how they're going to do this, you know, when I, you know, it's just, it's just weird to me. And yeah. um, like I said, you're taking the human element. And two, I don't like to see people get, re- I don't like to see people lose their jobs and get replaced with technology. Um, yeah, that's yeah, an well, ongoing issue. Yeah. You see it in retail, or, or the McDonald's near me now. Um, there's no cashiers. And well, that's all right. We got it down here yeah. with the sun passes right over the tolls. Too. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everything's all sun passes. You, got, you go to a supermarket, you have self checkout. Right. So, yeah, all right. they're all self checkouts now. They're I actually I like went to the, the cashier. I went to the manager at Walmart when I was there and I asked him for my paycheck. And he said, What are you talking about? I said, Listen, I came in here to shop. You're putting me to work. I want to get paid. <laughs> Right. Exactly. <laughs> I <That's> agree. <laughs> yeah. That's well, you know, there's perception reality. The human right. element is what it is. But you know what? The grand old game is going to keep playing no matter how many times you think you can tweak it to get it right. As you guys keep saying, let's shave off that extra minute, two, three, four, five. And you know what? I got two words for that. Okay. You ready, guys? Yeah. Big yes. deal. Yeah. So yeah. just imagine, just imagine uh, this guy going to the unemployment and he goes, okay, yeah, we'll, you know, work with us. We're going to find you a job. What did you do in your previous career? He goes, I was an umpire. Uh, you got a lot of openings for that. Right. <laughs> right. That's true. So I don't know. Robot umpires go figure. Uh, I don't know, but, it, and, and, but it's something they're and, talking about. So might as well, somebody at least can address it on a baseball right. Tuesday with the exception of one guest. Hey, I would I would love, Rick, if uh, as this progresses and you find mm-hmm. that information, if you would go to the Sports Exchange page on Facebook um, and just post something about, hey, an update on the robots. Okay. That would Sounds be fabulous. Good. This way we don't yeah, have to wait. that's a great idea. We don't have to wait for a Tuesday or whatever to, you know. Well, we have a new team that's coming uh, in High Point, North Carolina, it's about an hour and a half away from me. It's outside of Greensboro. They're called the Rockers, and they are a new team in the high in the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball. And I tend to go to the game, so uh, maybe I'll I can get a pick with a robot umpire. To oh get yeah, it. definitely. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, yeah, and give that. him a name. Yeah, make sure he smiles too. Yeah, you know, I'll, 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 I'll call him like uh, you know like R two D P you know that's Wild fun, Thing yeah. Dash two four nine you know whatever his name. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you do that, <laughs> and I'll make sure we put. Post that uh, picture on the uh, South Florida Tribune as well as the South Florida right. Tribune pages. You don't have to worry about it. But anyways, uh, we'll wrap this thing up here. We got uh, Louis uh, Avalon coming on the program in just a moment. But any final thoughts about robots or anything uh, you want to say about Mickey Lowe's before we have a chance to talk to him? Uh, Mickey Lowe's is a great uh, person, one of the best pictures, a legend. And um, I'm excited that uh, he's on the show. And um Tell him I said, hey, all the way from Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. All right, we'll do that. But meanwhile, uh, Rick, thanks for being on the program. And, uh, and we'll bring, we'll look forward to bringing you on next week. Okay, Rick? Thank you very much. As long Rick. as you don't replace me with a robot. I'll be no, there. Rick. <laughs> Not a problem. I can, think of, I can think of people I'd replace uh, with a, a robot, problem. but I, I assure you. <laughs> I'll guarantee you're not one of them. Okay? We got we got <laughs> possums and badges that could do better than robots. There you go. No, you're, 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 you're safe there, Rick. Just keep up the good work, and you're safe, okay? Thank you. So Take care, Rick. See you, Rick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Rick Hurdy, everybody. All right, now let me, before we get to Lewis Avalon, okay, let me go over some basic information about Lewis. I, came, I uh, met Lewis on Friday up in Fort St. Lucie uh, at the Mets ballpark. He's played in, uh, he's a seven-year veteran, Played with Atlanta for four years, the Dodgers for three, and he split time last year with the Philadelphia Phillies and the Chicago White Sox. His career mark is 19 and 10 with a 3.09 earned run average, 399 games, two saves, and 308.2 innings. Here's what's interesting about him 
we got a left-hander coming up at the top of the hour. And now we're going to wrap it up uh, in the first hour with a left-handed reliever. Right. And I've always been a firm believer that left-handers have a lot more rope when it comes to getting the bigs than a lot of the right-handers do. And uh, Louis Avalon is, uh, uh, was invited. Well, you know why? Why? Because you need a certain amount of pitchers, and left-handers are there are many less left-handers than there are right-handers. Oh, there's no question. I remember years yeah, ago so when I covered the four lottery. I need a left-hander. I only got 12 guys to pick from. I need a right-hander. I got 320. Exactly. Well, uh, one of the things I remember covering minor league ball years ago was a guy by the name of Ray Fontenot. Yeah. And Ray Fontenot, a former Yankee player. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Cubs, he's a, he was a classic example that left-handers move a little quicker, whether they're great or not. So with that said, let's go to Luis Avalon, Peter. And uh, then we'll bring oh, on yeah. Mickey Lowledge uh, very shortly here yeah. on the South Florida Tribune hotline. So Luis is about ready to hit the WEI network airwaves. Yeah, where is he? There he is. There he is. Okay, Luis, go ahead and take it away. All right. I'm speaking with uh, Luis Avalon. And Luis, uh you know, I know you're a non-roster guy trying to make the ball club. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, where you've come from and what you're looking to accomplish here with the Mets. Well, uh, Scott, I'm, tr- I'm just uh, trying to accomplish to make the team, you know, trying to show uh, these guys that I'm healthy, I'm fully healthy, and uh, I'm capable to get uh, people out. Okay, well, you're obviously on a team right now which can use you. You know, uh, yeah, I know you w- were with Philadelphia before, but – you know, the Mets are in a situation where, you know, they're not contenders yet. Yeah. So how much can you feel that you can bring to this ball club? Well, I bring experience. I mean, they leave for a long time, and uh, I know how to get people out, and uh, uh, that's pretty much what I'm bringing to this team. Now, what type of role have they told you that they're looking for, a long reliever or a closer, or have they given you any role, or are you trying to figure out what that role is? No, 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 no roles. Uh, just trying to show them that I'm healthy, and that's it. That's pretty much it. Uh, I think that if I'm healthy, uh, I can deliver it in the, my best uh, experience. So uh, I'm just trying to show them that, that I'm healthy, like I say, and I try to make the team. Okay, what are your thoughts about playing in New York? Uh, I like it. Uh, I always like to go to New York, and uh, I like the stadium, and it's going to be fun. Uh, so now, obviously, uh, let's talk about some of your other stops. Can you uh, give me an overview of uh, every stop and what you took out of each of those stops? Uh, what stops? Uh, in other words, your previous teams. Oh, well, uh, I came out in the big league with the Brave. It was a uh, fun uh, uh team for me because I had the opportunity to play with Chipper John and uh, then I went to the Dodgers which is uh, we made the playoff every single year that I went there and uh, it was pretty fun to play with that team and then I went to White Sox uh, it's a new experience because uh, that team was in the rebuilding process and uh, uh, I made good friends there and then uh, in the end of the year last year I was with the Phillies and uh, also played with a bunch of uh, nice guys so I like it yeah, well, so it looks like the White Sox were your only American League team. Otherwise, your background has more or less been in the National League. Is that correct? Yes, yes, uh, that's correct. And what was it like playing in the American League, knowing that, uh, you know, you, you didn't have to hit, you had the designated hit, hitter. Was that refreshing, or do you like playing with the National League uh, uh, folks? Uh, um, well, it's, no, it's the same thing. Uh, you still have to make up people out, uh, put the guys out, and the set. Do you uh, describe yourself as a control pitcher, a high uh, power pitcher? What type of uh, pitcher does Luis Avalon classify him as? And just uh, locate, uh, trying to locate the pitches, and uh, that's it. That's pretty much my game. So you know, obviously, if you had an opportunity to uh, uh, get to know some of your teammates, I know you got. Uh, Robinson Cano, you have some pretty experienced guys on this team. So what's your experience been like here during spring training? I like them. I like them all. Uh, they're nice guys. Uh, they have a lot of experience as well. And uh, it's been uh, fun so far. Have they welcomed you uh, with open arms in this uh, clubhouse? Absolutely. They're nice guys, and uh, I've been enjoying playing with this team. Have you had an opportunity to work with Chuck Hernandez at all? Yeah, yeah. I know Chuck since last year. We talked a little bit when he, he was a coach for the Braves. And I like him. And uh, it's been fun. 
Yeah, Chuck, just so you know, Lewis has been a good friend of mine since 1982. So don't know if you were quite born back then, but the one thing about Chuck that I've noticed is not only is he a good mechanical type of uh, guy, but his moves to the uh, to the base pass were unbelievable. What have you been able to get out of Chuck Hernandez? Well, we've been talking not that much in mechanic and anything like that. We've just been talking about the game and how I like to pitch, how I like to approach the guys, and that's it. You know, and, and so how do you like to pitch, and how? what is your approach when you're actually on the mound? Uh, well, I like to pitch the, the guys inside and then uh, attack him with my soft pitches. Anything else you want to add about what, how much you can actually benefit this Mets team uh, once you're able to go ahead and make the club? Well, I try to get the lefties out. That's, it. Uh, that's pretty much uh, my goal. I uh, try to put guys out and uh, uh, give, give everything I can to make the playoff. So, uh, you know, and how, how close do you think the Mets are for, to, to actually turning the corner to make the playoffs? I know they've made some pretty good additions during the offseason. They've added Cano. I know they had a guy named Keon Broxton, so they've added a little speed and defense. And I'm sure they made a lot. Uh, do you think that this team is much closer to the playoffs than most people think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They have a... Uh... Uh, on paper, we look uh, fantastic, so I'm pretty sure we're going to uh, be in the fight for that playoff pass spot. What was it like playing in Philadelphia? It was great. I mean, uh, it's in the big league, and uh, I love playing in the big league, so it was fun. And uh, the Bryce, you kind of miss Bryce Harper uh, a little bit. What do you think he's in for out in Philadelphia? What kind of an acquisition is that going to be for the Phillies with Bryce Harper? He's great. I mean, he's one of the best uh, all-around players in the game, and they make a, a good sign right there. All right. Well, listen, uh, Lewis, I can't tell you how much it's been a pleasure um, of mine to talk to you, and uh, I'll be look, monitoring your situation during the course of the 2019 season. So, Lewis, once again, thanks for uh, being on the Sports Exchange. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. The WEI Network is the world's entertainment and information network. Talk radio and entertainment from prominent individuals and business owners, as well as national and local celebrities, plus live interviews and broadcasting of events. Do you need a marketing and promotions for your next business or organization? Contact the WEI Network at 561-290-4597 or email us at inquiries at weinetwork.com. This is Adrian Mazzone, president of Transmedia Group. We're a full-service public relations firm serving clients worldwide since 1981, headquartered in Boca Raton, Florida. I wanted to put a challenge out to you. I want you to think about the last three accomplishments and how proud you are that you got through it and what you did. But who knows about it, and how are you getting that message out? Let us know how we can help you. Check us out, transmediagroup.com, or give me a call personally, 561-750-9800, extension 2270. Let me know you heard it on the WEI Network. Uh, this is Ray Romano, and uh, Peter's Living Room is a great show, and uh, he hasn't asked me to be on it, but he did ask me to do this promo. I guess men of a certain age and women, too, like to listen to it, and uh, so do I. Peter, why don't you have me on your show? And now back to the show. All right, we are back here at the Sports Exchange, and your thoughts about Lewis Avalon. Uh, Sam, start with you. Yeah, I mean, if he can really prove that he is healthy and that he can get out, then uh, I don't see why the team shouldn't take him. You know, he's really shown that he's putting in the work, he's grinding, he's healthy. Put him on the team, Coach. What about you, Peter? Yeah. I made my gut feeling – is if he makes the team, he's going to be a long reliever. Right. That's my gut. Okay. A middle reliever. Well, I mean, he wasn't good. But, but he's got experience. Right. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the Mets have been one of those teams on paper, should be a contender every year, but they get hit with all these injuries. Uh, I mean, devastating injuries. And, uh, you know, you get somebody, he's proved he can play. Right. You know, he can endure. He's in a good situation up there with the Mets, too, because when you yeah. think about what the are, Keon Braxton, a guy who needs to improve his hitting, or he'll be run out of New York like he was yeah. in Milwaukee, is a good defender and with a lot of speed. But Braxton has to get his act together with the bat, and he needed to take extra batting practice. 
Robinson Cano was on that team. I saw him hit a home run against the Marlins yeah. on Friday. So you know he's going to definitely be a big offensive threat. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, you bring in uh, Luis. He's in a good situation where, yeah. you know, on, to me, a non-roster invitee is the equivalent to a uh, undrafted free agent. It's a, a walk-in. Grit. Yeah, it is. And that, if they work out, what do you got invested in them? Mm-hmm. Is it everything to gain? Nothing. Right. The situation. And you're right. This guy's a left-hander, and he has pretty, he's performed at the level, and they need him. Right. And as we said earlier, um, there's a lot less inventory for left-handed pitches, relievers, right. or you know whatever, than there are right-handers. Yeah, no matter how much the game always changes, you know whether they're trying to speed it up or whatnot, let me tell you, if you're a left-hander, People are going to look at yeah. you, and you have a longer shelf life. Right. You really do. So, so how come you weren't an athlete? <laughs> you know, I uh, I guess my parents should have pushed me harder. No, no, no. I'm kidding, Mom and Dad. Don't take that seriously. Um, honestly, I just enjoyed doing a whole slew of things besides, you know, just putting all my time to either basketball or soccer or mm-hmm. football. Now that I look back, it's like, yeah, maybe I should have put in all that work for it. But um, well, not basketball. <laughs> actually, I think I think I'm probably out of all out of all the sports, I'm probably best at basketball. Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, I know when I have kids, I'm gonna make sure if they want to play sports, I want to make sure that they play their sports all day, every yeah. day. You know, you know, you know what I mean on that. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Of course, he's a basketball player. He's the <laughs> tallest one of the group of guys here. Well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, compared to on, us, hold on, hold on. he's what a. What position were you? Um, I was always a two or a three, but I was always shorter back in the day. Now I kind of grew a little bit, so I kind of yeah. can fill three or four. But you put me at the point guard position, I'm facilitating. I'm putting yeah. the ball in your hands, and I'm getting the assists. We're winning the game. I'm not quite sure where I've been in these days. I wouldn't even try to think about it. Yeah. Well, I wasn't good at basketball. No. Uh, I could pass. I could play point. Nice. I couldn't do a layup. My free, I mean, I was terrible. Yeah, my shots. Terrible. I was shot's as a terrible. kid. I was in a basketball league. I was the and everybody had to play at least two minutes. I was the one that the coach had to find the two minutes to put <laughs> me in. Well, <laughs> that was yeah. me for an extended well, I mean, time. I used to like the layups, and then I'll tell you what. Uh, later on, as I played, uh, but all star in baseball. As it, well, yeah, I was, I was. Yeah. I mean, but I, I. I as I got older in my twenties and thirties, I used to like the bad boys image, and I used to take elbows Ooh. and shove people around. Yeah. Work. Now my, the people didn't like it, but I enjoyed it, uh, doing it anyway. And you still live. I am here in this uh, right studio with you guys, aren't I? Yeah, it's funny. I guess I must have lived to tell about it. But baseball was my best sport. Uh, I played it six years. I was a catcher. And, yeah, so was uh, I. Yeah, so I mean, and I was a pretty good one, an all-star one. And I used to warm up pitchers. I used to take a beating behind the plate, and I did what I did best. I used to frame pitches and distract the umpires to get. Did you get hit uh, on the chin? I got hit everywhere. Yeah, I remember. I mean, the ones that bounce. Yeah, I got a cup. It still hurts. Right. Oh, yeah, but right. I mean, I I just want I could I remember like it was yesterday. Right. The guy. I mean, he popped it up right up, and I flipped the mask off as he was finishing his swing. Oh. And that edge of the back just came and caught me. Oh, right. Yeah, I, yeah. I participated in some little league baseball, some yeah. some local stuff. But one of the reasons why I never continued to do it was because every single time I got up to the plate, I was petrified that I was going to get hit by the pitch, really? and I just yeah. completely deterred me from yeah. the sport of baseball. This will catch you. I probably have watched more little league World Series games than I have major league World Series games. I wouldn't doubt it. Really? Yeah, I love the Little League World Series. I wouldn't doubt it. Well, one of the things that you guys are probably wouldn't be surprised about is being a former catcher like I am, a lot of my great interviews in spring training and, and throughout Major League Baseball have been with the catchers. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, the other positions are fine, but when you've been in the, at the position, you can really relate it to the guys that are actually doing it. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of my favorite catcher interviews, I can uh, – one, one of my old – one of my good ones is uh, Brad Osmus, the manager of the New York – I mean, rather the – Los Angeles Angels. He's a good one. Mm-hmm. James McCann of the Detroit Tigers. And the list. Yeah. Ray Fossey of the Oakland A's, another good one. So. Yeah, I was going to interview Thurman Munson. He asked me to take a ride in his plane with him. And I said, I, I really can't. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I didn't. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not so sure how far you'd have gotten with that interview. Yeah, but Munson, it, would, it would never have been aired. Well, believe it or not, a guy that I really That's sick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's sick. The, the one, speaking of catchers, though, one that we're going to be mentioning a lot in, uh, 
Mickey comes on that I really enjoyed was Bill Freehand, Mickey Lowe's battery mate. Yeah. Bill Freehand, uh, oh, I'll tell you, him and Mickey were a dynamite tandem. They really were. Yeah, and then one day I was hanging out with uh, Ojeda from Cleveland. Yeah. And he said him and the guys wanted to go out because they borrowed my boat. Uh, and I said, I can't give you the boat. Sorry. Good thing I didn't give him the boat. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure I want to go there, but I know it's yeah. a place in Winter Haven now. Yeah, something yeah, like that. that. I'm not so sure you need to Google that one. No, yeah, so, definitely not. But Bill Freehand was a catcher I really enjoyed. Yeah. And when the 84 Tigers had Lance Parrish was a good one, too. Mm-hmm. Like a I remember Parrish. Yeah, he was pretty good. And you brought up Little League. Um, wasn't it like maybe like 10, 15 years ago, um, the Boynton Beach Boynton Beach Kids won, yeah. and Apopka, which is up near Ocala, right. won one year. Right, I remember that. Yeah. My grandfather sang at the world, uh, the national anthem at one of those World Series. Oh, really? And I, mm. I just remember blue. Oh, there was like a dark blue and yellow Boynton Beach boys basketball. Yeah. I mean, uh, baseball. baseball. Yeah, yeah, baseball team. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's interesting when you get a team from near your hometown. Yeah. You know, but I just, I just like it. I mean, right. You show some pride. Huh? You show some pride when it's you like a local team. Um, yeah, I mean, these and these kids can play, you know, a lot of them can play. They know the basics. They know the fundamentals. Uh, unfortunately, by the time they get to the major leagues, they forget the fundamentals. That's true. Bunt, you stick the bat out, you hit the ball eh, 15, 20 feet, you know. I actually enjoyed bunting. If that meant that I can uh, move the guy over, I wasn't that great of a hitter. But yeah. I did the little things I had to do. But defense is my strength. heard a story yesterday about Reggie Jackson. Right. Um, uh, Billy Martin and him, they really didn't get along. Right. And Billy Martin gave him the signal to bunt. He was mad at him. Right. And it's like, you know, Reggie Jackson's home run hitter. You don't give him a bunt. Anyway, uh, he attempts to bunt, strike. And then Martin takes, and, and Jackson's pissed that he had a bunt. Uh, and then uh, Martin took the bunt call off, and Jackson said, you know, screw you, and he went to bunting, and then he struck out trying to bunt. He got suspended for five games. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> it's, it's funny that you say that. There was a, there was a, um, a similar situation that happened in a, in a soccer game where the coach – on, is actually Chelsea, the Chelsea Soccer Club. Actually, the coach tried taking the goalkeeper out before penalties, and the, the goalkeeper was like, "You know, I'm staying in." And the coach got really pissed. Okay, well, anyways, I think we have our featured guest on the moment uh, in a moment here, Mickey Lowledge, uh, the 1968 World Series MVP, is about to join us here. And uh, like I said, it's, it's going to be great to have Mickey on the program. So, uh, you know, again. Uh, the 1968 World Series, you want to talk about one of the greatest performances in the series. The man on the uh, South Florida Tribune hotline is about to give us. And wel- Mickey, uh, welcome to the Sports Exchange. I appreciate you being on the program. Okay, let's see how this goes. Uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. Uh, well, I want to joke around with you a little bit about me colliding into your patio door, Mickey. That was uh, one interesting situation. <laughs> Well, I've never had anybody do that before, so you're first on the list ever. <laughs> you know, I've been told that. Well, wait, so you, he's going to be the talk of the party, right? You, gotta, <laughs> you can't believe I had this guy here the other day. and yeah. Well, I'm glad I could be first at something. I know you've been first at uh, a few things, and we'll get to those in a moment. But when I was eating with Tom Gage last night, yesterday, he told me that you were uh, – that you write with your right hand and you pitch left-handed. Why don't you uh, tell the listeners uh, that story, Mickey? Okay, I got. want to let you know something here. Right from the beginning, I've sort of reconsidered doing this show, but I'll go along with you for a while. Okay. You know, I wrote a book. It took me one year to write the book. Okay. And the book is available on Amazon. And I can guarantee you that all the questions that I will be asked are in the book. Okay. So you're going to have to come up with something completely unique because I don't want to give away all the information that's in my book. I want people to buy my book. Well, don't worry, Mickey. I've got the platforms for which to do that. So for those individuals that don't have it in front of them, okay, I would appreciate it if you go over a couple of things, and I'll make sure that uh, uh, the word gets out there. I am impressed, though, that you did sell 151 of them now on Sunday, and you'll have an opportunity to go into more detail about the book. Is that fair enough? Okay. 
Uh, yeah, as long as we don't get into, you know, 45 minutes of book questions. <laughs> well, I hope not, Mickey. I uh, think I prepared you pretty well when I was out there about some of the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, and I think we're going to probably stay along those lines, okay? Um, let's talk about the 1968 World Series uh, team. Uh, the magical season went in three games. Uh, I know you had a uh, complete game in uh, – and the, uh, what was it like to, uh, going up against Bob Gibson uh, be, and being the MVP, winning three games in that series, Mickey? Well, you know, at the time when we played the 68 World Series, the uh, two Cy Young winners were uh, Bob Gibson and Denny McLean. And uh, when it came down to game seven, I'm pitching against Bob Gibson. And I sort of know I got my hands full a little bit. But I've already won two World Series games. You know, they're both complete games. And I was being asked to pitch on two days rest. And it's like, well, that's a little tough when you're going against a guy like Bob Gibson. So uh, I agreed to do it. And uh, I was told that I was only going to pitch five innings. And at the end of the fifth inning, the score was zip, zip. No runs have been scored by either team. And as I walked off the mound, I sort of patted myself on the back and says, well, you got through the five they wanted you to do, so now it's turned over to somebody else. But lo and behold, they wanted me to pitch one more. And uh, when I got through that one, as I'm walking off the mound, okay, you know, I'm all right. You know, I, I, I did what they asked of me. And then they, I was asked, can you go one more? Well, <laughs> 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 I got that every inning I walked off the mound, even in the eighth inning when I, we had actually uh, taken a lead. Uh, can you go one more? And I went, ah, oh, what the hell? I got nothing else to do. I got the whole winner off. Right. And I said, okay. And so I ended up with another complete game. That's in the book. <laughs> okay. I, well, I have a question. I have a question. When um, okay. when you went up, like Bob Gibson, when you uh, started a game against um, somebody as a pitcher as dominant as a Gibson or anybody else in that era, did you ever go out there with the butterflies or you know saying, "Oh my God, how am I going to beat this guy"? No, not really. I was a guy that uh, everybody referred to as having ice water in my veins. I didn't right. let anything bother me. And uh, anytime I was going up against a top-notch pitcher, a catfish hunter, a Gaylord Perry, well, Gaylord wasn't even in the league then. I shouldn't say that. But he came in the league later. Uh, Jim Palmer, go through the list of them. There was a lot of great pitchers back yeah. in the 60s. Yeah. And I always got myself up for them. And actually, they're some of the best games I ever pitched. <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's like a true professional. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm the best. I'm going to win. Period. When you won that World Series MVP, Mickey, what was it like to win the World Series MVP, especially against a dominating team like the St. Louis Cardinals with Lou Brock and a lot of great players on that? Well, when they came in and announced that uh, I was the MVP, I was sort of, really? I mean, you know, because K-Line had a great World Series. Jim Northup had a great World Series. Lou Brock, he had a fantastic World Series. World Series so, yeah, but you won three you know, games. I, yeah, but I also hit my first major league home Right. Run, you know, and uh, I ended up getting three hits in the World Series, and I was a lousy hitter. And, uh, <laughs> how many how many home runs did you have in your career? One. That was it. Yeah. You know what? That's that such a it, that's know. such a great trivia question, sports trivia question. I, mean, I always used to say, you know, if you're going back in that era, if you're playing against Cleveland and you had four hundred to five thousand people in the stands. That wouldn't be a good time to hit your first home run. <laughs> Why not wait till there was 60, 80 million people? Yeah, there? really. <laughs> so what was the feeling like, Mickey, to defeat Bob Gibson? Well, you know, I wasn't defeating Bob Gibson. I was defeating St. Louis Cardinals. Right. Okay. 
I mean, they they had a great lineup, and uh, I mean, I had to bear down them throughout the whole ball game. Right. The only time I slipped up a little bit is when I had two outs in the ninth inning, and Mike Shannon came up the bat, and I had a four to nothing lead, and he was a dead fastball hitter, and I said to myself, "Well, you can't walk him, you know that could jeopardize things." Right. And so I threw him nothing but fastballs, and when he hit the ball out. I make the score four to one. I was like, "Yeah, I told you, Mick. You should throw them all fastball. You might be in trouble." I was mm. one run, you know. Okay, so describe the hug with Bill Freehand after the World Series uh, when everybody's got a picture. That's memorable. <laughs> well, that was sort of uh, how do I say this? When a pop up went up between first base and a catcher, or the catcher and the third baseman, my job was to go over to where they were at as they were, you know, closing in on the ball that was still up there. And I was supposed to sort of judge which one is going to get there first by the way they're moving. And so I started running towards first base, not first base, but between first and home because that's where the ball was. And I looked at Norm and I looked at Bill, and Bill actually had a shorter run to get to the ball, so I was running towards him, and when the ball went down in his glove, I mean, the World Series was over, and he was actually bigger than me, you know, and I figured, I'm going to jump on him. I'm not going to let him jump on me. So, <laughs> that's funny. That is that's funny. how the picture came out. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a great one. All right, so you recently had the 50-year reunion with the uh, team. What was that like over at Comerica Park? Boy, they looked old, I'll tell you all of them. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we had a, you know, we had a very, very good ball club in 68, and uh, seeing them all come back together and, you know, a lot of the guys from the 68 World Series team weren't there because they passed on. And we were talking about that a lot, about so-and-so was with us. And he's not with us anymore and how he helped us win that year as a relief pitcher. Or, you know, back and forth, Eddie Matthews isn't with us anymore. You know, it's sort of, you know, sort of great feeling to be able to be there for the 50th anniversary. Yeah. So you know, that, that's basically what the discussion was among the players, you know, happy to be here and very thoughtful of the guys that helped us win the pennant that year. So you, you had the, the stand, I mean, you were in New York for a little while, I think you, did you end your career with San Diego? Was that? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, I was, uh, do you ever consider yourself anything other than a tiger? No, not really. I uh, uh, when I went to the Mets, I was a starting pitcher, and then I, I actually retired from baseball. And then the Met, uh, the Padres called me and uh, said, "We want you to come out to Arizona, Yuma, and uh, see if you can make the ball club." And I did. Yeah, but I was strictly a little a relief pitcher out right. there. My starting right. days were over. Okay, Mickey, would uh, tell me, um, not winning the Cy Young Award, do you think that that attributed to your Hall of Fame snub? I know a lot of Hall of Famers have one on their resume. Yes, I think that has a big thing to do with it. Because uh, when you win the Cy Young Award, I mean, that jumps out at everybody. And I always say that's probably one of the main one of the two reasons that uh, I haven't had any great amount of Hall of Fame votes. Okay, what came together for you in nineteen seventy one? You had twenty five wins, uh, and Billy Martin was your manager. Billy Martin used to love complete games. How, how what was your experience like with Billy Martin? <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Every question you've asked me so far. Well, uh, I I don't know, he was just a guy that uh, he said something to me that we met during the winter, and he said, you know, you're, you're a strong guy. You can pitch a lot of innings. And I'm telling you right now, the first six innings of every game you pitch, no matter what the score is, you're going to pitch six innings. So if you get yourself in trouble out there, you better get yourself out of trouble. Uh -huh. And 
I thought he was kidding me. I was pitching one game against Baltimore, and I was down four to nothing in the second inning. And I looked over at the bench, and he was standing there with his arms folded, looking right back out at me. Well, I got myself out of the jam that inning with no runs being scored. And uh, I walked in. He says, in Billy's language, what the hell were you looking at? I <laughs> 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 I okay. actually used stronger language if you knew Billy Martin. Oh, well, but actually, I, I did get to know him a little bit, but go ahead. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, things are sort of going bad out here. I looked down at the bullpen. Nobody's warming up. And I'm out there, and I got myself into a super jam. And he says, I told you, you're pitching six innings. You've got to learn how to get out of them. And that changed my whole confidence for the year. I mean, it really did. And. I knew if I gave up two or three runs early in the ball game, I was in there until the sixth inning. And a lot of times we would tie it up and do things, and which worked out great for me because I ended up winning 25 that year. Okay, well, let's talk about something that isn't in the book. I'm sure you welcome that. Is today's game making you too specialized? Uh, because I know back then you had a lot of complete games, and you said you probably could have had more. But nowadays guys are limited to six, seven innings, and pitch counts are involved. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that I can talk about. I, I do not like today's ball game whatsoever. You know, there's been so many changes that have taken place in baseball that then, first off, the number one thing they did after 68 was ruled the year of the pitcher. They dropped the mound from 15 inches down to 10 inches. And, you know, Pitchers live with their fastball. They all do. The good ones live with their fastball. And by dropping from 15 to 10, it takes away from your fastball. You need that extra height in the mound to get the leverage to be able to throw up in the 90s, high 90s. Didn't, and they, didn't they change the mound when Gibson had that, had that what, 1.15 ERA? They lowered the mound the next year? Yeah, plus McLean won 31 games. Right. You know, so they decided they were going to make this decision to lower the mound. Now, the one thing I didn't like about that decision, the Players Association was never asked about it whatsoever. Our union wasn't that strong in those days. And they just made a new rule in baseball. We're going to lower the mound. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I pitched a lot of innings in my lifetime, tremendous amount of innings, but I never had to worry about Tommy John surgery and this and that. They have more injuries to pitchers nowadays than ever had in the history of baseball. And it's all because of the bound being lower, their velocities are down a little bit, and then they got that stupid pitch count for some reason. Yeah. You know, 100 pitches, you're out of the game. I understand that. I understand the 100 pitches. But I know that I started to lose a velocity after 100 pitches. I threw an average of 135 to 145 pitches a game. When you throw hard, you get a lot of foul balls. Mm -hmm. And that runs your pitch count up. But that's when you learn how to pitch. You don't have your super good stuff anymore. And once you learn how to pitch... You know, pitching becomes actually easier. But they got this thing. We don't want them to hurt their arms because we got so much money invested in them. Right. And so they yank them out there, and then they start running in the, the parade of relief pitchers. You know, now they're even talking about changing that rule. You know, they're always changing rules. <laughs> well, it's funny. You t <clears throat> talk about changing the rules. What are your thoughts? Could you have ever pitched on a pitch clock? A pitch clock? Yeah, they're talking. Uh, about, I mean, that to me, I, I don't, I couldn't tolerate that's not, it. That's not good because if you're pitching in a game and you're pitching a day game someplace and it's hotter than a son of a gun, a lot of times you get the ball back and you start rubbing it up and all you're doing is stalling, you know, just to sort of get your wind back in your lungs where you can start pitching again. And heck, I, I've worn, I've rubbed the baseball up for thirty seconds before I even turned back to the mound to throw. So I think it's a stupid rule, totally stupid. They'll regret it. Yeah, I mean, and what, and what about mound visits? Uh, I know they went from six to five, and who knows what they're going to 
you know, I mean, that's another rule they're looking to uh, for, to change the game. What are your thoughts about the amount of mound visits? Did you ever have a lot of time to talk to your catcher in the dugout between innings? Oh, uh, yeah. My wife said, well, something I missed the end of the thing you said. Oh, they're talking about if a relief pitcher comes in, he has to pitch to at least three batters. <laughs> well, what the heck? I mean, you know, you bring a guy in to get one left-hander out and you get him out if you're a left-handed pitcher, and now you got to face two right-hand hitters or maybe are monster hitters that love to jack the ball out of the ballpark, and you're out there? I mean, I know they change pitchers way too damn much, excuse my French, but uh, they, they keep playing with it. What? God, why can't they play the game of baseball that used to be played back in 1935, 45? <laughs> hey, I've got a question. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I got it. Being that you don't seem to be an opinionated type of guy, um, <laughs> you know, they're testing out these um, robot umpires. We were talking about it a little earlier. Have you heard about that? Yeah, I've heard about it. They're going to test them in the minor leagues. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Could you, I you know, I, pretty soon we'll have a starting lineup of, uh, you know, nine robots out there playing the game for the players. You know what? When they do holograms, it's going to be a 3D um, uh, video game, basically. <laughs> you know, in 3D. So tell me, yeah. Mickey, uh, how much did you want to become a, a mailman? Did you have aspirations to become a mailman? Oh, yes, I did. I did. I, uh, it's in the book. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, here's, here's a question for you, Mickey. For us young folk, talk about your work ethic. And did you have a strict regiment when preparing for games? Did you work out a lot? Tell us, tell us uh, some about your regiment. Yeah, okay, it's in the book, but I'll tell you. Uh, I learned from a trainer who was a very good friend of Satchel Pages, and Pat Satch could pitch on two days rest, one day rest, whatever he had to do, and he used to cook his arm with a towel wrapped around his arm, turn the water on as hot as he could turn it, and stand there for 15 minutes. And the trainer would tell you when your 15 minutes was up because we didn't have a clock in the train in the shower room. And what it does, it uh, all that heat you're putting on your arm is flushing out all the stiffness, all the bad blood that's in there from pitching the day before, and it rushes fresh blood back into your arm. And you know that was the day after I pitched, and then the second day, my arm felt pretty good. You know, and I would actually go down on the bullpen on the third day, the day before I pitched. We used to pitch every four days then. And I would actually loosen up in the bullpen. I'd probably throw 50, 60 pitches in the bullpen, just sort of loosening the arm up. I didn't soak my arm that day, but my arm was fine. And, and I'd go out and pitch on my schedule day to pitch. You didn't need any high technology to uh, work your arm back into shape. <laughs> well, as long as the hot water heater kept running. Yeah, you know, right, right, okay. right. You just needed electricity. <laughs> All right. Now, okay. now, Mickey, when I wasn't banging my head up against your uh, patio door, okay, uh, and we were talking about your donut shop, let's talk about how much you would be worth on today's pay scale because these guys are getting paid a lot of money. Well, I know you've heard this many, many times, but, you know, I'm 78 years old. They probably wouldn't give me a whole lot of money, but... Uh, huh. <laughs> but in your prime, I probably I probably would be making some money in my lifetime. You know, at, uh, if we were playing under the present day salaries, uh, I played professional baseball, including four years in the minors and sixteen years in the big leagues. And this is in the book. I made a total of eight hundred thousand hmm. dollars. Wow. 20 years of baseball, I made $800,000. Years ago, I um, saw an interview with Joe DiMaggio. Now, he was alive. Steinbrenner was still around. And he was asked that if he was negotiating a contract today, you know, and, and like in his prime, what would he demand from Steinbrenner? And he, he said, I'll walk up to... Steinbrenner, 
put my arm around him and say, hello, partner. <laughs> yep, yeah, that's, that's what these guys are today. They're mostly, you know, I used to say we played baseball because we love the game. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what was going on, we love the game. But not I when these guys are playing. They're basically corporations, you know. They're, right. They're they're playing for the money, you know, the big right. money, you know. Right. And I have one more question for you. I'm gonna actually open this up for you. Um, is there anything about baseball that you would like to talk about that's not in your book? <laughs> anything special? Well, I, I, like I said, I, it took a year for me to write that book, and I covered a tremendous amount of topics. You know, my life story is really what I wrote. Yeah. I, I wrote it for my, my daughters. I had three daughters that didn't, they would come to ball games, but they didn't know what was going on. And then I got four grandsons that never saw me play. Right. So I went back to the beginning of how I got started, and I worked my way through the book. I talk about my youth. Then I talk about Game 1 of the World Series. Then I go back to my youth. Then I go back to Game 2 of the World Series. So, so this is your uh, legacy. Yeah, yeah, it's my legacy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had a lot of people read it. And I have got a tremendous amount of compliments over it. They said the book's unique in the way it's written. And I guess... I don't I forgot what the question was, but I, I, I just want if there's anything you wanted to talk about that you don't have in the book, anything that you know about Major League Baseball or sports um, that kind of tickles your fancy or that you have passion about. Well, I don't know if I put it in the book or not. I'll sort of answer that one. Uh, when these guys started developing this. Uh, uppercut swing to hit home runs. Yeah. Uh, there's an umpire. I won't use his name. But he said, the ball's been hopped up too. You know? Which so Major League Baseball wanted to see more runs being scored. Right, they juiced Major the ball. Baseball doesn't like, Major, League, Major League Baseball doesn't like two-to-one ball games. Right. They want to see those football scores up there. So... I think that's wrong with the game, but people like it. They like to see the ball jumping out of the ballpark. Well, I and, thought uh, I, I thought they kind of juiced the ball a little bit um, to to keep the home run, to keep the you know scoring up, and pull away from the quote the steroid era. So you know what? They're not using steroids anymore. They, you know, you know, they're not juicing up with a needle. They're just juicing up the ball so the ball will travel further. All right. Let me... you know, I, I, I have every single win that I ever won in the big league except for five balls. They were the last ball of every game. Uh -huh. And I've compared balls that I was throwing to the modern-day baseball. I got my hands on one of those. Yeah. And seams were higher on the ball than I threw, which means you could make the ball move more and do things. Interesting. With a modern day baseball, it is wound so tight and the seams are, you can barely grab onto them. So I'll give credit. I have a guy that used to pitch in Detroit. Man, he, he was challenging all my records all along the way. He threw no hitters and everything with this modern ball. I'm talking about Justin Verlander. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean, he, what he did in the time he pitched in Detroit with a hopped up ball and things like that, I give him all the credit for the world. All right. Walk in Hall of Famer. <laughs> uh, Mickey, let's talk about today's players. I, I remember covering a game with the Tampa Bay Rays and the Detroit Tigers. And I think a lot of players uh, this day, they don't know the history of the game. They, the situation I'm referring to is Mike Marath. And when I asked him about your name, he didn't know you. And then Troy Percival looked at him and said, really? You don't know Mickey Lowledge? Are you fascinated that a lot of guys don't know about the history of the game? Well, they don't care. You know, it's like, I'll give you an example. They, they sent Willie Horton, uh, our power hitter that we had on the Tigers, to spring training to work as sort of an assistant batting coach during spring training. And he was talking to major leaguers, you know, he wasn't talking to minor leaguers. 
and he was saying, you got to do this, you got to do that, and, you know, the, how you got to get ready. And they, you know what they said to him? Hey, you played a long time ago. I don't do it that way. Don't talk to me anymore. Uh, they, they don't care. They, they, they're, they're into themselves. You know? So tell me. We used to, I'm sorry, when ahead. we went on road trips, we always had room, roommates. Okay. Had somebody a roommate. Some to have breakfast with, some to have dinner with. I mean, you became very close to your roommate. Nowadays, these guys have their own rooms. They don't want a room with anybody, you know. And they all want to play their own music. Yeah, they don't want to share the same yeah. women. <laughs> Can you have imagined yourself playing in the high altitude of Denver, Colorado? What would that have been like? I mean, the way those balls fly out. Well, actually, I did play a couple of weeks in Denver. Did you really? But, uh, yeah, I did. But, uh, you know. It's like playing <laughs> wiffle ball. Tough, but, but, huh? That's like playing wiffle ball, isn't it? No, oh, yeah. The ball just jump out of that ballpark. It's <laughs> ridiculous. Why they don't win the pennant every year, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I know they had a humidor for a while, and there was actually a no-hitter actually thrown, I believe, at yeah, Force right. Field. Yeah. yeah. I mean. Yeah, and never know. <laughs> would, now, would you say that catchers are uh, today are better or worse than they were back in the day? Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. You know, the only ball team I ever watch is the Tigers. And uh, <laughs> I don't watch other teams play. I, so I can't really answer that question. Okay. They're better today than they were, you well, know, back in when I played. How, how about Doc Ellis? You remember Doc? I remember the name, don't remember a yeah. whole lot about him. Oh, uh, okay. Then the rest of the question won't mean anything, so we can move on. All right. Now, obviously, being from Metro Detroit, okay, I found it ironic, okay? We joked around about this when we visited, okay, that you had a donut on a bat, okay, to a donut shop. I mean, you had, <laughs> I mean that to me is pretty cool. I mean, you had to... Obviously, so let's uh, compare donuts here. The donut shop versus the donut on the bat. And I'm going to let you go ahead and say what you want so I'm not putting my foot in my mouth about what is or what isn't in the book because uh, I, I prefer to keep my feet on the floor, not my mouth. Okay, Mickey? All right, go ahead. Well, I did say earlier that I wasn't a very good hitter. Okay. I like my bat every time. 110. And there would be no reason in the world why I would put a donut on a bat. <laughs> <laughs> it would make a damn bit of difference. <laughs> but meanwhile, you made them, and there were a lot of carbs in them, and uh, that was your life after baseball. I mean, that that was pretty interesting. So, I guess uh, I know you sold your donut shop uh, 20 years ago, but uh, what do you say to people when they still? Uh, uh, say that they like your donuts. I mean, knowing that you're 20 years removed from that. <laughs> the best story that people say to me a lot of times, I was up at your donut shop, <clears throat> excuse me, I was up at your donut shop last week and I bought a, do a dozen of your donuts and boy, they were really good. Hmm. And I say, really? I say, yeah. And I says, well, how are your teeth? And they sort of look at me really funny. And he says, well, what do you mean, you power my teeth? I says, I haven't made a donut in 23 years. And if you ate one last week from my donut shop, your teeth must be, man, they're hard as concrete. How did you chew them? That's <laughs> they're trying That's to be funny. nice, you know. <laughs> so what are your thoughts about Krispy Kreme donuts? I've had them. Have you? you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I tasted them. You know what? Uh, there's only one donut I get there, and there's a, and if I go to Dunkin' Donuts, there's a different donut I get there. But I'm very selective about my donuts. So, <laughs> so you think? And that that's the thing about people. I mean, uh, I learned that in the 18 years that I owned the donut shop that uh, people eat the same donut all the time. They have their favorite. You know, they they, they don't really seem to change. Yeah, now they got the donut wars here. You got Krispy Kreme, you got Dunkin' Donuts. Boy, we're getting on a subject eventually. I'm get hungry about later on, but uh, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you reinvented yourself uh, at your little donut shop, and now you, there's a Dunkin' Donuts in every corner. Although I didn't see one near 
where when I was near you, I had to go a few miles away, but still. I, <laughs> let, let's talk about some of the ballparks you played in. Uh, were there any favorite ones you like to play in? I know Yankee Stadium, Fenway Park are favorite or difficult ones. Why don't you get into the ballparks that you uh, played in, and uh, any were there any that stood out? Well, I was talking earlier about uh, Cleveland Indians only having 6,000 people in the stands. And Cleveland, I could take my glove and throw it on the field, and they were beat. I, I won more games against Cleveland than any other team in baseball. <laughs> oh, did you really? Uh, one of the hardest teams for me to pitch against was the Oakland A's, especially back through the 70s. Uh, one time they were the Kansas City. What were they? Kansas City something. Then they moved to Oakland. And uh, when they Kansas got out City there, A's. yeah, the Kansas City A's. Right, right the athletics. <laughs> They showed the A's and they went to open, but uh, they were a tough club boy back there through the through when they moved out there when they had Sal Bando and Reggie Jackson and all those yeah. guys. You know, Catfish Center they had a great pitching Raleigh staff. Raleigh Fingers was so, there then, right? Yeah, Raleigh, Raleigh Fingers. Yeah. You know, I, have a, he was, I, I have a question <laughs> for you. Um, yeah. You um, um, your twenty six hundred and seventy nine strikeouts is the second most in AL American League history by a left-hander. Who was number one? Yeah. Sabathia. Oh, oh, right, right. Yeah, he broke that. He broke my record. Uh, I don't think it was – I don't know if it was last year. Last or... year, I think. How did you feel when he broke your was... record? Yeah, I think it was last year because there was the talk about them keeping him active because of the record. Yeah. Well, you know, I – I started out by uh, being the number one strikeout pitcher in both American and National leagues, and then Randy Johnson came along. Mm-hmm. That other guy that he screwed me up to, so I held the record as American League strikeout guy since uh, 1975. I held the record, and uh, Sebastian broke up last year. So. Well, in the decade, the 65 to 74, you struck out more batters than any other major league pitcher, and you, even more than Gibson. <laughs> well, I could say so. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> and actually, you, you know, you mentioned Gaylord Perry before. Yeah. Uh, he was the only one who pitched more innings in that decade than you. So, you know, you know, your complete games, and I think you were, weren't you the most winningest pitcher um, in the American League in, like, 65 to 74? I know Gaylord won more in the majors, but I think you were the uh, uh, number one in wins in that decade. Okay. Uh, Mickey, let me ask you a lighter question, okay? I know you're an opening act for Vic Damone in Vegas. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, how might it have gone uh, if you began your uh, singing career? Uh, uh, had it started a little bit earlier? Pick the moan. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I what was the, the end of your question yeah, about? Yeah, okay, so uh, tell me um, if you had begun your singing uh, career earlier, how far do you think it could have gone? <laughs> Obviously, you like to sing. Is that correct? <laughs> uh yeah, yeah, but. Uh... I sort of got thrown into that. Did you? You know, it, the, the story's in the book, but I'll tell you. But uh, I knew a group of guys at a local watering hole that uh, they were called the Four Stores, and they had a little act they put together. And, I mean, they had a deal that they did certain things when they were up on stage performing. They were like the house band. And I wandered in there one day by accident. Just I stopped in there. I'll, I'll try this place. And uh, one of the guys was a local radio guy from uh, the Mount Clemens area, Detroit. And he spotted me immediately. And uh, you know, he came over and on one of the breaks. He says, uh, "You want to come up and do a song with us?" I says, well, "What makes you think I can sing?" You know, and he says, "Well, you know, I figured." 
we can cover up any mistakes you make. I said, well, thanks a lot. You know, in front of people in the bar, and they got all those beer bottles and everything. I might get hurt up there. And he said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll cover it for you. So I went up there, and I had my favorite song I like to sing. I always sang it all the time. It was called The Wayward Wind by Kobe Grant. And she was a girl, but I liked the song. And I said, uh, she says, what do you want to do? I says, I want to do The Wayward Wind. And he says, we've never heard of it. I yeah, said, so. oh, okay. And the piano player says, you start it and stay a cappella with it, and I'll pick up the melody, and then the guitar guy will pick it up, and don't worry, it'll fit. Well, I started singing away, and all of a sudden the guy started thinking on the piano, and one thing led to another, and by the time I was done with that song, they knew the whole song. Everybody was playing it. And I got a little applause, and I walked off the stage. Nobody threw anything at me. I was ready to duck and dive. I didn't take baseball helmet up there with me. So, so Mickey, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, what happened was in uh, 1968, uh, Denny McLean was at the Riviera Hotel playing the organ, and the Riviera—not the Riviera, but the Frontier Hotel—called my agent and says. Can Mickey do anything? We'd like to have him come out here for a couple of weeks. And I, my, my agent calls me and he says, "Hey, I got a call from the Frontier Hotel. They want you to come out for a couple of weeks. What the hell can you do?" You know. <laughs> I says, "Well, I don't want to be a stand-up comedian because I'm not that good at it." But I says, "I know how to sing." And he went, "What?" <laughs> I thought I, I he, he didn't believe me. And I says, well, why don't you come out to this little bar and uh, listen to me? And he says, well, where's it at? And I give directions. He says, okay, I'll, I'll come out there on such and such a night because it's going to be after a, a, a ball game, you know. And uh, he says, I'll be damned. He says, you can sing. He says, well, I'll tell them, you know, that what you can do. And I said, well, okay. So, you know, we we started start start practicing to put things together, you know, to get everything down pat. And there is a famous restaurant in Detroit on the river called the Rooster Tail. Right, I remember that. Well, they have all these big time entertainers come in, and Patty Cage was there, and she blew her voice out, and they're going to have to cancel the four nights, the uh, three nights that she was there. Well, my attorney, he said, well, why don't I bring Mickey Lolich in? And they went, what? You know? And he said, oh, yeah. You know? And he says, what's she going to do? He says, she'll sing. She's got an act to put together. And so I took the group, and we went down to, you know, and filled in for Patty Page for three days. We were we were getting ready to go to Vegas. So, you know, so the night they announced I was going to be there, the best thing in the world was that all the guys were still in town. Uh, you know, a lot of guys used to live in Detroit, a lot of players. Now, practically nobody. But they all came down that night. Uh, they didn't see me make a fool out of myself, but I uh, I got through it, and then I really got back at them because I called them all up on stage. And so, you know, I had fun singing. Okay. It's all in the book. I, oh, I, I have two more little minor things I want to wrap these things up with. Number one, uh, obviously, uh, you like the Daytona 500, so I know that the Daytona 500 isn't uh, in the book, right? So do you have a fascination for auto racing? Yeah, I got a chance to drive a car when I was uh, on a tour of the United States doing a thing for Look Magazine, a photograph session all the way across the United States, and we ended up in Daytona, and I was out at the track, and, uh, Bill France Sr. was there. I was down in the pit area just talking to guys and drivers and things. And Bill came over and says, you want to take a trip around the track? And I said, sure. You know, I said, so I got in a car and uh, happened to be a Dodge Charger, same car, the World Series, not the same car. But, and he says, this looks like a standard everyday drive them car. It's got the doors that open and close. Right. It's got seats in the back. It says, but underneath, it's not a full-blown race car. Right. Right. And I went, oh, okay. And so I run down on the lower part of the track. I 
ran like three laps around the track. And he says, I want to show you something that's interesting. And I said, what's that? He says, I want you to pick up your speed next time around and take it up to 125 miles an hour and get up the center lane. And when you go into turn three, because I want you to get up to 125, take your hands off the wheel. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I figure he owns a darn racetrack. He's worth millions and mil millions of dollars probably. So I did exactly what he told me to do. And at that speed, the car will stay exactly in the center lane going around the track and the banking of the turns and everything. Wow. And I thought that was so fascinating. I became an NASCAR fan. Well, you know, on that note, Mickey, I'll be covering the 12 hours of Sebring over the weekend. So uh, I, I wanted to make sure that I got that auto racing uh, um, mentioned in. So meanwhile, Mickey, I can't thank you very much for being on the show. I'm glad we had a chance to meet and, uh, and I'll make sure that uh, the word about your uh, book, Joy in Tiger Town, gets out there on all the uh, media uh, uh, pages that we have available out there. So meanwhile, it's been very pleasure to have you on the Sports Exchange. <laughs> and uh, thanks for being gracious with your time, Mickey. It's been an absolute pleasure for all of us here on the network. Okay? Thanks a lot. Thank Mickey. you, Mickey. All right. Thank you, Mickey. Okay. Appreciate you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye, Mick. Bye, Bye. Well, what can I tell you? You know, Joy in Tiger Town. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. I want everybody to start to go ahead and look on the Sports Exchange and the South Florida Tribune page. One question I wanted to ask him, but we think we all knew the obvious one going in, is we all know that uh, left-handers have a much bigger shelf life than others. Uh -huh. Well, when you have so many things you want to talk to them about, there are certain things that you leave off the obvious. And once we got on that donut uh, tangent. Yeah. I had to let that one go as far as I could, and I think that that was something that's pretty good. That's funny. Because a lot of times people, uh, players, when I start looking for guests on the program, I always like to know what an absolute player does after their career is right. over. And Mickey told me uh, when I was speaking to him at his place that, uh, you know, if he had had the money he had now, he wouldn't have had to try to find ways to go ahead right. and get the money to have a donut shop, right. but you know what? In the end, Mickey Lowledge made w w w out, and you know what? I don't care what he's anybody says. He's still around. He's still yeah, around. He's around. Living and, legend. Living right. legend. And, and more importantly, I will say this: for all those, in the, he does belong in the Hall of Fame. I really, too, tru truly believe that he. Well, does you know what? I, I'm Fame. telling you, I'm, I'm looking at his stats, and he does. I will go there. Uh, but to more complete for, games than any other AL hurler. Uh, the leader of that was Gaylord Perry. Uh, he had more wins in the decade, AL pitching wins in there. Gaylord Perry was the only one in Major League that had more than him. Uh, he struck out more batters than Bob Gibson in Gibson's great year. Right. I mean, he's got, and he's got more complete games than anybody. And, and, but, and there's something I should add, yeah. too, is how many more could he have gotten? Right, right. Uh, with the couple of minutes we have left, he's got... Sammy's got something with uh, Quick. Quick, yes. Quick. And you, you've got it right in front of you, a promotion. Yeah, i got a promotion do here. This promotion. Don't, don't forget to download Quick, the first social gift card app. It is available in both the Google Play Store and the App Store. That is Quick, G-W-I-C-K. And what I have here is a promotion. The promotion we're running is on Chipotle gift cards. Right now, if you, if you go onto the app and download, you are able to get half off on your Chipotle gift cards. Yes, I said half off. You can get a $10 Chipotle gift card for $5. Quick, the first social gift card app. All right. Very cool. And you are going to be at Sebring. Yeah, I will be at Sebring on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. This chair will be occupied by Candy Ebling. Right. She'll be sitting across the table with you, matching what's ends, right. while I burn through a couple cell phones and uh, have that tar uh, around me the whole time. Yeah, I hope we ring. remember to answer the phone. <laughs> me answer the phone? We'll see if no, you answer you. the phone. Not you. I said I hope we remember to answer Well, the you phone. know what? I, I got, I'll i be working on my tan if you don't. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I mean, it'll be a pretty high octane. It's pretty neat about when uh, I was uh, talking to Mickey a while back that yeah. whatever you do, I can't talk to you about the Daytona 500. All right. It's humor time. We've got like a minute and a half left. Okay. How did you walk through his glass door? <laughs> How did I walk through it? I yeah. walk in the house, okay? Yeah. And I see the door closed, but because I had so much energy going in there, I didn't realize that it was closed until I 
Hit it. <laughs> Hit it. And he was asking me about this earlier today. He said, have you walked any more patio doors? Do you walk into them at home? So no, Mickey, the only difference between your patio door, or as we call them back in Detroit, door walls, yeah. is yours connects to a patio. My patio door goes to the back to the uh, backyard. Uh-huh. But we got a kick out of it, you know. The, as you get to know them. When you was, told me the other day, that, yeah, you well, know, well, you it saw was a great still, meeting. Uh, but I, I walked it in, into his glass door. Well, well you saw, and I know people who've done that. It's you know. But he's still laughing about it. I mean, I've heard of breaking the ice, yeah, yeah. but I wasn't looking to yeah. break the glass. I right. mean, that's a different story. But you know what? It was a, you got people have to understand when I was meeting him for the first time in person. Yeah. A guy I grew up with, and now I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Now instead of being a fan, I got to put my business cap on here. Right. That's right. And, and therefore. You know, Walk it's a different situation, right. but it worked out break real that. well. Good way to break and I do want to end this uh, show up by saying th- uh, special thanks to my friend Tom Gage, who's yes. a longtime, uh, s- former longtime sports writer, who's a member of the Baseball Hall of Fame for helping me set this up with Mickey Lolich. Tom Gage will be a future uh, guest on our show, and he is a member of the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame and the Writers Wing. So, yeah. Tom, if you're listening out there, Thank you very much. Mickey, thanks for being on the program. And Tom and I will be in touch. So right. meanwhile, I will be on the road to Sebring. You'll be here. Candy will be here. Uh, right. And Sam, it's, I'm glad you were here and you had a taste of baseball history today, buddy. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, guys. For Peter Wien, for Scott Morganroth, for Sam. Samuel Charles Yeah, K. we're going to go from uh, yeah. quick to quick on Thursday. Right. All right. Have a great night. Have a great night, everyone. Yeah, you bet. Bye-bye. Bye.